Well, good morning to you. It's good to see everyone here this morning, and I do want to give God thanks for the time that we're able to serve you and worship God with you this week. Uh, grateful to the Lord for the friendships that we do have with uh, Jason Gillespie and his precious family. It was a good time of fellowship uh, with him, his wonderful wife and daughters, and also uh, grateful for uh, Larry and Jean. They're just not good hosts, but they've been upgraded to super hosts. <laughs> um, just uh, a great time of fellowship, just a warmth, and so it's, it's always good to see the work of God's grace in the heart, right? And so we're thankful for that. Pray with me. Father in heaven, uh, we, we come before you with uh, such a, a deep sense of dependence, a need for you to work in our hearts, to continue the good work that you've begun. That because you're God who keeps his word, you will complete the day until that work until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for this fellowship on this day. Thank you for the time we've spent together so far. We need to hear from you, your slave, your ambassador stands as your instrument, believing in the power and the presence of the Spirit of God to enable, uh, to sanctify him in every moment, every phrase, every thought, every word that will be sanctioned and approved by heaven. That the congregation will walk away and say, truly the Lord was with us. We pray that there will be a drawing nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. What a privilege we have as saints saved by your grace. Wretched, ruined sinners to reclaim our Savior, Jesus Christ, your son, offered himself up for us. May we stay humbly submitted to the cross and rejoice that when you speak to us, we can hear and respond in obedience with joy. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I ask that you turn with me and open a copy of God's word, your copy of God's word to Ephesians chapter 4. The fourth chapter of Ephesians and the subject matter this morning is just simplest contentment. Contentment. I read the verses 10 through 20 of Ephesians 4, but our concentration will be in verses 10 through 14 of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived thinking about me. Indeed, you were thinking about me before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I learn to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in abundance in any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to fellowship with me in my affliction. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church fellowshiped with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Oh, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. 
I have been filled, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will fulfill all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So what is the opposite attitude of contentment? It is when you long for something better than what you have. Uh, better in the sense that you will not be satisfied until you get what you think you need. That is the natural disposition of the fallen heart. It is also the natural drive in our fallen world. Not satisfied until certain demands are met. Certain expectations are met. Contentment is not natural. It is a learned attitude. It is, as Jeremiah Burroughs calls, a rare treasure. I will add an endangered treasure. In our text, contentment, although it is a beautiful treasure, it is a glorious treasure, it is a process of time to actually arrive to a settled disposition of contentment. When we look at our text this morning, we will observe that contentment is actually a school. It is God's training grounds, but it is God's school through circumstances of life. Now, as we examine our text this morning, what was Paul's reason for bringing up the the doctrine of contentment? Well, Paul's primary reason for writing this letter was to thank the church for their care and generosity, which he does here in Philippians. But there are several other reasons for the letter. Another is that he wanted to inform them how he was doing. They were concerned about his situation. He's in prison. They loved him dearly. They want to know how he was doing and bearing up under God's sovereign circumstances. He also wanted them to encourage them on what they should do, to comfort them in what they should do. For example, how to live in harmony with each other. You had two women in Philippians chapter 4, and when women get in conflict, oh, bless the Lord, what a time. You women are wonderful. You're beautiful. You're God's gift. But when you women get in a tussle, look out. We all have to choose a side. He's encouraging and comforting them to agree in the Lord. That's, that's the essence of the Christian life. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think it's true. That when we find our common ground in Christ, all other issues become non-issues. He wanted them to remain united for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to model the example that Christ left for them. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. He fulfilled the will of the Father, not himself. He did not look out for his own interests, but the interests of others. But then, for example, in chapter 3, he wanted them to hold fast to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't lean on your own righteousness. Trust in the justifying grace of God who declared you righteous by faith and not by works. And then, in our text this morning, he wanted to express his gratitude to them. So basically, verses 10 through 20, Paul is laboring to say, thanks, guys, but wait a minute. I have something to tell you. And so his thanksgiving to them for their giving is interrupted by one of the greatest treatments of an often neglected virtue, and that is contentment. So now, where does it come from? Well, dear listener, contentment comes from God's self-sufficiency. And that is the core meaning of the Greek word for contentment in our text. It is 
self-sufficiency. So when Paul says, I've learned to be content, he's saying, I've learned to be self-sufficient. Now, that may trip us for a moment when we consider that, but no, it is so rich. Because this contentment is God's self-sufficiency. It means that God is infinitely great, and he's infinitely complete within himself. He is, as we know, the holy, uncreated one, in whom and by whom and for whom all things exist. And so, because God is unsupported by his creation, he needs nothing outside of his divine nature to complete or satisfy him. Now, you are not naturally self-sufficient, but you receive this benefit in Christ. In what way? Christ in salvation, is your all-sufficient one. And because he's your all-sufficient Savior, here it is. This is how you apply it personally. Contentment is when you do not need anything to support you or anything to keep you satisfied. Nothing in the world, no thrill, no happiness, no achievement, no human vainglory, nothing in this world to keep you filled and satisfied. Because Jesus Christ is all you need. So uh, a general application or principle from this timeless truth is this. Because God is self-sufficient, you need nothing outside of Christ to be content. Because God is self-sufficient, you need nothing outside of Christ to be content. Now, let me just give you a general overview of verses 10 uh, through 14. Uh, Verse 10 is the introduction to the gratitude, or to the Apostle Paul's gratefulness, and then verse 14 is his first conclusion. He had more than one conclusion. Nevertheless, in verse 14, you've done well to fellowship with me in in my affliction. He wants to extend his thanksgiving after he concluded with this section like, hey, I'm grateful, but I really need you. But don't take that as a disrespect. I have everything I need in Christ. So if you left me hungry, I would not be less satisfied because I have the full satisfaction of my Savior. And then verses 11 through 13, which is really the core of the outline this morning, is the explanation on contentment and where we will frame our thoughts from this great doctrine. And so the goal this morning is to encourage you to grow in God's school of contentment because the attitude of contentment is unnatural to us. We just have to have one more thing. Like, you know what? Dinner was good. Here it is. But if you had dessert, it would be the best. Just a small example. Verse 10, this is his rejoicing. He begins his rejoicing in verse 10. And when he says that he rejoiced in the Lord greatly, in the Greek text, it's really emphatic here. Uh, There's a deep sense of gratitude. He's filled with great joy. He's rejoicing in the Lord with, with immense joy. His joy is immeasurable. And it's gratefulness to God in the Lord, this this union with Christ that we share together. I rejoice in this common bond that we share together because of your generosity. And notice he says that, now at last, you have revived your concern for me. That's the NASB translation. The legacy says, now at last you have revived thinking about me. Beautiful. Just a beautiful portrait of what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Um, the, the word concern or revive actually comes from the concept of a flower blooming for the first time in a while. So there's a blossoming of their giving. It also pictures a tree springing to life after a long and a harsh winter. It's, it's bloomed once more again, their giving, their generosity, their thoughtful concern. But then as he says this 
this giving has revived or this concern for, for, for him has flourished, he's grateful that their thoughts about him is not just thinking but action. Paul knew that thinking was central to the life of faith because we're rational people and thought precedes action and it informs duty. But the life of a disciple is not just to think on these things, but to do them. So the sense in this text is not only did they revive their concern or their thinking about him, but it had corresponding action. It was not just some, hey, I'll pray for you and I'll forget, I'll try to get something to you, but I may not. They were concerned, they were thoughtful, and they acted upon it. And why was this the case? It's because the Apostle Paul says in chapter 1, that the gospel had an impact on their lives. After hearing the good news, God opens the heart of Lydia and other men and women there in Philippi. Acts chapter 16 begins that chronicle to display that to us. And God does a great work in their lives. And from then on, they became partners in the good news. The gospel. Once again, it may seem like it oversimplifies it. But we are united only through the gospel of God's Son. And when men and women divide, they're dividing over the gospel of God's Son. And these are gospel issues. Divisions in local churches, it's a gospel issue. It's not just a mere matter of men and women thinking they have preferences. It's a gospel issue. What keeps us together, what binds us together is the good news. And it is not just thinking about the good news. It's the impact of the gospel on the heart of the converted sinner. I often reflect on that issue here in our society, especially in America. Let me just bash your nation for a minute because I'm an alien here. My citizenship is temporary. I just follow what Peter says because he's inspired by the Spirit of God. The amendment is not inspired scripture. God's word is. I am an alien here, enjoying the privileges for a brief season in America. But American Christianity in general is suffering because the good news is not making its truest impact. There are a number of men and women in our midst, maybe this morning, but at large in the Church of America, who are just simply not converted. It's the gospel that works in the heart. And when, when the women when hear the word of God preached and the conviction of truth is there, it brings transformation. Not argumentation, but change. Not conflict, but conformity to Christ. That's what the gospel does. And that is why Paul, in chapter 4, with these two women, can just say, hey, just agree in the Lord. Live in harmony in the Lord. It's like, Paul, don't we need nine weeks of counseling on, on harmony? And our theme song is Ebony and Harmony, living together in perfect harmony. Ebony and Ivory, you ever heard that song? Side by side on my piano, keyboard, why can't we? We don't need Ebony and Ivory as an example. We have Christ as the example. It's the gospel that unites. It's the good news that fathers and advances affection and care and love and humility and this togetherness that is inseparable. And so that had an effect on the lives of God's people here in our text. Paul says that if you go back just a few pages uh, to chapter 1 or scroll on your holy iPad, back a couple of bars to chapter 1, uh, verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In verse 3 of chapter 1, verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I mean, what keeps people together? What keeps them thinking and sharing and giving and loving? It's the good news. Nothing else. Not a pep rally, not a speech, not firing up the saints with some video display, but what Christ has done for us in salvation always stirs the heart with gratitude and activity. 
And the thought in our text includes deep care and concern. It was not just the exercise of the mind, but it was the activity of the heart. But then Paul, as he's grateful for their generosity, he wants to make it clear to them, listen guys, my gratitude is not out of desperation. Can you imagine when someone tells you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, you almost feel guilty to do that and do it again for them? Paul was like, hold on, guys. I appreciate the gift. Don't get me wrong. But he's given thanks from a place out of contentment, of contentment. We already said this timeless truth. Because God is self-sufficient, you need nothing outside of Christ to be content. So let's go to verse 11, and that is where we find the first observation here, and it is that your life is God's school of contentment. Your life is God's school of contentment. It means that this class is a lifetime course. Not that I speak from want, for I learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. So that that phrase, whatever circumstances, it means all of life. Nothing that happens impacts his settled conviction and trusting in the self-sufficiency of his Savior for him to live a self-sufficient trust in Christ. So when Paul says, I learned, he's referring to the past. And I think just based on the examination of the text, it was over a period of time that he grew in his understanding of what it means to rest in Christ and be satisfied in him. And I do think that is an encouragement to the saints that this is not instantaneous. This is not fast food Christianity. This is progressive. It should be encouraging because for the most part, it is easy for us to be unsatisfied or discontent than it is for us to be content. And there's so many illustrations of that. And I'll be more than happy to give them to you in a moment. Because we're generally always thinking in a sense of half full and half empty instead of half full. So it takes time to learn this lesson. But what he's saying is that he's in a settled position where he's learned this consistent pattern of contentment. So you learn in this case through your daily routines. Your, you learn through the circumstances and the situations of life. As you live, you will see how God uses moments from the mundane to the mighty to teach you in his school of contentment. This word once more refers to self-sufficiency or self-supporting. You need no external support. So someone who is self-sufficient within himself lives within the resources they have and are not affected by perceived lack or real lack. But once more, this self-sufficiency is not natural. Other religions may practice it through monastic disciplines of material isolation, But here in this text, no one is isolating you from the world. You are in the world. You hear the world's longing and its cry for more. And then you watch the commercials and they say you deserved more. I mean, the supersized fries came because they thought you deserved more and you will pay for that more. And it is not that we live isolated from the world. It is that as you live in this world, you are not moved by their appeal. And there was, a, in Paul's time, a, a popular movement called Stoicism. And they did apply contentment, but it was someone who possesses within himself or herself the power to live free of any dependency. They would see them as self-made people using their willpower. They are unmoved by circumstances. But that sense of self-sufficiency lacked emotion and passion. It was almost like stoic, stiff. No emotion, no passion, no longings. So you're suppressing the emotions and the affections that God has given you 
for this fake sense of sufficiency. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul was far from that because that is far from God's reality. When you begin to abstain from things that God created for you to enjoy, you're no different from those who are departing from the faith according to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's not what Paul is saying here. As believers, we should not suppress our emotions. Emotions are God's gifts to us, but it's in a fallen body. As believers, we should not withdraw from the world to achieve anything. We're supposed to be in the world because that's not a display of power. I mean, hiding from the world, does that display God's power? Monastic living, is that God's power in, in the presence of sin? No, it's not. It's a cowardice approach. That is not what Paul is saying here. What the text explains here is God inspires Paul is freedom from the power of material dependency. It is not freedom from material things, but it's freedom from the power of material dependency. You may have stuff, but stuff does not have you. You may possess material things, but they do not possess you. You may even obtain material possessions as a result of your work or your skill, but you are not obsessed or controlled by them. Paul is saying that your union with Christ, and in that union, nothing else outside of Christ is necessary to complete you. Nothing outside of Christ is necessary to rejoice in the Lord. You have the gift of eternal life through Christ. You, you were brought with a price, and you glorify God. And the God you serve is self-sufficient. And because God is self-sufficient, you need nothing outside of Christ to satisfy you. Therefore, you need nothing but Christ to live with contentment. Earlier I mentioned the mundane moments and the mighty moments. There are some moments in life that are subtle and may escape your attention. For example, you may be comfortable in saying this. Hey, honey. I don't ask for much. All I ask is for. It's fill in the blank. You know, kids, I try to keep this home happy and, and joyful and fun. You have a roof over your head. We pay your bills. We feed you. All we ask is that you. Is that wrong? Not necessarily. But does that leave you unsatisfied? Does that produce complaining? Do you rejoice less when things don't pan out your way? When you say, I don't ask for much, all I ask for is, now that one is saying that I need this particular thing to fulfill me. I need this particular thing to make me happy. It's beyond all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. And if I don't get this, the home will not be happy. The job will not be happy. The kids will not be happy because they will know and they will see my frustration. That means you are not pursuing contentment. Subtle. Subtle. Johnny had three scoops and I only had two. Subtle. I mean, someone was saying that he lived with such a displeasure in life that he would get ice cream for he and his spouse. They will share time together, and, and he will put scoops in the ice cream. As he's walking to give her the ice cream, he's trying to weigh to see which one is weighing more because he wants the bigger one. Contentment, is it not? Your life is in this school, and your responses to circumstances reveals whether or not you're truly satisfied in the self-sufficiency of Christ and you need nothing else but him. So here's another thought. I call it the contentment equation. It is Christ plus nothing. That's it. Christ plus nothing. Absolutely, positively, nothing but Christ. And even if you may have preferences, although they're not wrong of themselves, 
they cannot weigh into the contentment equation. It's been a good sign to examine that is if you are controlled by natural things. Now we may have some certain momentary you know, situations that we like, well, oh, this is great, and you're really happy about those things. But when they're gone, are you just as grateful to God, thankful to God, rejoicing in God, satisfied in Christ? Well, if that be the case, think about this. Are you the person who lives with Christ plus something else? Do you see your life having addendums and attachments, footnotes, things you must have? Just think about your general disposition. Because Paul said in chapter 1, I want you to know, brethren, that the things concerning my circumstances, similar to what we find in this text, led to the greater progress of the gospel. But Paul is saying this while he's in prison. And then he says that there's some who are preaching the gospel to cause more affliction to my chains. And the illustration Paul is using there in that passage is just, just imagine someone who has stocks on his feet. And the guard wants to afflict him. And so the guard tightens the stock on his feet until his feet starts to bleed and, and pus is coming out and there's infection in it. That's the picture that Paul is painting. Those who are preaching the gospel just to get at Paul are trying to cause more affliction. But he says, what am I going to do? He says, I'm going to rejoice because Christ is being proclaimed. And that's real life circumstance under the umbrella of the sovereign good God. The gospel is going forth. Paul says, I have nothing to complain about because Christ is my full satisfaction. He's all that I need. I need nothing else but him. So self-sufficient living, Christ and the joy of knowing him. You're satisfied with Christ and you need nothing else to complete you. And your life is God's school of contentment. You're learning, you're observing, you're seeing what contentment looks like. When something is given to you, and the Lord takes it away, and it's something you really value, and what is your disposition? Does your joy bar go down? Then it's really happenstance. And do you rejoice less and complain more? No contentment. Because once more, the equation is Christ plus nothing. That means you're, you're not up and down one day because of the various changes of life, the things you may gain, the things you may lose. Nothing alters your satisfaction with Christ. But then verse 12, I want you to notice this. This is the second observation. It is that your life circumstances are God's lessons in contentment. So your life is God's school, but your life circumstances are God's lessons. And if you look at verse 12, it varies. He says, I know. So he has knowledge on how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in abundance or prosperity. In any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. So your life circumstances are God's lessons. And you look at this text, the Apostle Paul has extremes here. He has humble means paired with prosperity or abundance, being filled with going hungry, having abundance and suffering need. So... It's like bookends, what we'll call them. Here's one extreme, humble means paired with abundance. So it's not just Paul is unchanged on both ends, everything in between. It never changes. I have a lot, not as much as I used to, not as much as I wish. Now I have a lot less, nothing changes his attitude. Whatever the conditions are from one extreme to another and everything in between from poverty to riches, from being full to going hungry, it's a life that is totally filled with the knowledge of divine self-sufficiency that comes through Christ. And so the weight of life and its constant inconsistencies will not move your needle. You do not complain or bemoan when what you see does not meet your expectations. 
And when Paul says he knows in this text, he asserts a settled conviction. In other words, this is a final conclusion. When I learn this, now I know I will keep this knowledge with me until Christ returns. It's like saying that if I have everything but Christ, if I have everything but not Christ, I have nothing. And if I have nothing but Christ, I have everything. Because the stuff doesn't matter to him. Literally. Gain or loss, it, it matters not to him at all. And as he's learning through life circumstances, he's realizing that as he grows in his knowledge of Christ, he realizes that Christ is all I need. And notice he says this. He says, I've, I've learned the secret. The secret of being filled and, and going hungry. So the secret is really something that is exclusive, the exclusive secret of a particular discipline is the basic idea here. It involves the act of initiation or formally recognizing someone. It's kind of like another nuance to the meaning of the word. Uh, maybe you can see it as a process of officially introducing someone into a club or religion, like receiving someone into the local church after taking them through the membership process. Or in pagan religions, it was a process of initiation into their fellowship after meeting certain requirements. What Paul is saying here is that concept of this secret is to stress the exclusivity of Christian contentment. That this contentment only comes in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I can live in two worlds here. We can be, be believers wrestling with contentment, which is, is the case. Or we can be constantly, perpetually living a life of argumentation, griping and complaining, and that is a side of unbelief. Because it's not trusting in the adequate supply of our Savior who gives us what we need and material things excluded. The Apostle Paul says this is something only known in Christ, and as one commentator notes, that it's only known in Christ and unknown to the world. And this is so critical here. Uh, this is critical. We, we do need the help of brothers and sisters in Christ to help us when we start sounding like discontented unbelievers as professed believers. You need loving brothers and sisters in Christ who will give you a good gut check from time to time. Because you know you don't always check your own temperature. You don't check your spiritual oil. You don't check your radiator. And you can be blowing a gasket spiritually and you wouldn't even know the difference. But you need a, a humble, loving brother, sister in Christ and saying, hey, you, you're, you're smoking, my brother. And it's not your favorite cigar. It's you're heated with anger. And that anger is revealing that you're living in the world of Christ plus something else. This is only known to the Christian. In recognizing, and here's another important element, that the totality of your life belongs to God. All of it. So whether you have a nickel or a dime or you are so broke as they would say you can't pay attention, much less pay a bill, that your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. This is a, an exclusive Christian doctrine. Only the saint can live in the lowest of the lows according to men and still know that he or she is rich in Christ. Only the Christian. And all the world and their dissatisfaction, I mean, they have, some of them are millionaires and billionaires and they're still miserable. And the saint who has adequate means is so joyful. Oh, it's Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And here in our text, it's beyond the class and into life. Your life lessons, as I said, are God's instrument to build contentment. It's a building process. The foundation is laid in Christ, and now we build the structure through circumstances, and they're necessary. But this is not to earn a degree. This is not a career a move. This is not something you post on the wall. You don't walk around saying, boy, I'm really satisfied. No, this is something that comes in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ that transforms the heart. In part, we can consider what Paul says in chapter 3, and he says that, that I may know him. Oh, my dear saints, the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And the apostle Paul is not speaking of earning something. He wants to share in everything that is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. Leave nothing off the table when it comes to knowing my Savior. I want to know him in its fullness as God provides and supplies. Now, what may be some practical examples of circumstances and lessons to learn in life? Well, let me just consider the year that we're in. It is the beginning of the year. And the world as we know it is really battling for its sanity. We do not have world peace. And there, there's war among us. Nations and cities are inflamed. You have angry leaders and dictators. And then you have a world where there is no inner peace. You also have families crying out because their lifestyle is under attack. And I, notice I said lifestyle. It's not that they can't live. It's not that they can't survive. It's America. We want a certain lifestyle. I can't forget years ago when I was working and there's one of my bosses who should have retired, wouldn't retire. He just looks at me and says, you know, son, I know I'm taking your position and other young guys' this position, but I want to maintain my lifestyle. It's not that he needs the money. It's that he knows that once he gets that disconnected, he will be a miserable man. Groceries are expensive. Gas, especially in California, is not cheap. I mean, I know they say when we all get to heaven on the day of rejoicing, that will be. I had a bit of a day of rejoicing at the local Sam's here in this area. The gas was cheap. Life is harder. Man-made laws are unlawful, especially in the beautiful drift in California. But then when you look at the world, where is their sufficiency? Can they live presently with the way things are and still be grateful? But now we've got to make it more personal because we look at the world, we say, well, the world, I tell you, these people are miserable, but so are some saints. And if God were to chart the level of misery in our complaints and our thoughts and prayers, can you imagine what would happen? Wow. What a thing. There are things that should naturally disappoint us and others that should induce righteous anger. None of those things are wrong. None of those responses are wrong, but what is sinful is when you cannot live well because things are not as well as you prefer. You cannot live with a sense of joy and thanksgiving because things are not the way you think it ought to be. You see, dear listener, contentment produces thanksgiving to God. But it's, it's the same gratitude to God whether or not you have nothing or you have much. Whether or not the company accepted your proposal or not. Whether or not the school of your choice accepted you and they don't want to be that school for you. That your attitude and thanksgiving to God does not change. You won't run and, and hide or escape to your own inner sanctuary. It will be with the same passion, fervency, and desire. The same passion to praise God, the same fervency to love others, and the same desire to glorify God in every circumstance. In other words, the situation does not dictate your response at all. 
It doesn't alter your attitude. You can still be disappointed in sorrow and still give thanks. The circumstance does not place a demand on your worship to God. The disappointment does not alter your desire to give praise to God, to love your family, to love your children. You don't have to ignore your spouse or your children when things are low. Because when things are low, it's still high. All is well because of Christ. That's contentment. There is not one drop of one single event in one minuscule moment of your life, one second, one millisecond, one nanosecond. I'll stop there. Nothing alters your attitude because self-sufficiency is not found in your situation or in your own heart. It is found in Christ. Nothing else but satisfaction with Christ. So once again, the contentment equation is, maybe you know it by now, con contentment is Christ plus what? That's it. Because he is your all-sufficient one. And because God is self-sufficient, you need nothing outside of Christ to be content. So think about this. If you have an expectation and it fails, you're not satisfied, or there's a sense of loss, you've lost something important to you, or something that you thought that you desire, you didn't get it, what happens to your body language? Right? What about your attitude? Are you one of those groaners? Uh, uh. I mean, it's a language only the wife would know. Uh. And it's a different word for every groan. Seems like the same groan, but she knows what that groan means. Uh. If the circumstance leads you not to the better but the worse, then it's not Christ plus nothing. It's Christ plus something else. You are building idols. You are adding requirements outside of Christ for your contentment. So you're saying, in essence, you're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I love you, but you made a mistake. No, we don't think along those lines, but if God is in control over everything, and then this kind of thing happened, it's like, you know, as the saints were saying, the text, he says, well, you know, the devil's busy, but God is busier. And Satan can't do anything that unless God permits or allows. So it's all under the, the authority of God. And something happens that kind of throws you off some and your attitude. You're saying, God, you got it wrong. Oh, you dear, look at you, dear saints. You're like, oh. You're saying yes, but in your heart, it's like, no, please don't say it that way. I mean, what else could it be? You've made a big mistake, so I can't praise you today. So the, the object of your frustration may be your family member. But the real object of your frustration is your Redeemer. It's your Savior. Because when you're not satisfied, you're saying, God, you infinite, great, all-knowing one, you don't know something now. You didn't satisfy me. We know the dollar is weaker. And if you're young like me, your retirement is bleaker. Am I still content in Christ? Are you still content in Christ? Are you going to let a dollar dictate your disposition? Well, this is all a work of God. Once more, we talked about tests. Are you satisfied? Are you content? So take your daily desires or your routine in life and examine 
whether or not your contentment is Christ plus those desires. In other words, something may happen, and it could disappoint, it could be sad, and none of those, that's not wrong. It's does it change your response to God? Is he no longer your all-sufficient one? Is the gospel no longer enough in those moments? When you have those upside-down days, or what people call, and here it is, I had a, a bad day today. And I know, saints, I know you don't use that word. I know, I know you don't use that word. Right? No one uses the word, I had a bad day. You don't. You're, you're Christians, but you don't use that word. Let's define a bad day. Who made it? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. As the old saints used to say, Lord, have mercy. Who made the day? I just, it can't be a bad day. It's just not possible. I can't have a good God making bad days. It just can't happen within this theological sphere of contentment. That that, quote, bad day is as good as any other day when your joy is in the all-sufficient one. You know, the beauty is that you get to take this class over and over again because we all fail it. But it's not pass or fail. It's the glories of Christ. God wants you to know the Savior. But then he gives you the answers to the test. Know Christ. Love him. You get a retake. Paul says he's learned, so he was a repeat student. Remember, Paul wrote inspired scripture, but he was not inspired. Paul wrote infallible scripture, but he was not infallible. He was a fallible man. He was a fallen man. He had to learn through the disappointments of life. And I think he could write that to the church in Philippi when he told him his story. Hey, I wanted to go to this city. God, the Holy Spirit said no. One missionary failure after another. I wanted to go to this place, to this region. The Holy Spirit said no. That would have been disappointed all the way across the board because God wanted to lead him to Philippi. Have you ever thought about your circumstances like that? That God's no's are really yes, not that way? That God's closed doors are like, yeah, you don't want that one. To lead you to that ideal place of absolute joy and thanksgiving in his providence is where the no's are really yes, and the closed doors are open doors so you don't fail. Testing. Because then in those moments when there's a great sorrow over unmet expectations, we tend to gravitate towards our own God. And Paul says, I've learned to gravitate to this God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not controlled by the idols of the heart. My focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a lifetime lesson, and so your life circumstances are God's lessons on contentment. Enjoy the class. It's a good one. You know, the beauty of, like, flunking a class like this is that you'll see your same peers back in it the next year. <laughs> and it's nothing like flunking a class and no one in the class looks like you, or you reckon you're a year ahead of them, and they're, then you don't know who they are. No, there's a lot of familiar faces in this class. How many times have you taken this class? Child, I quit counting. I just come back because I know I didn't pass the last time. I keep taking it again. But this school continues to conform me to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I must move to the third one because I have a flight to catch. If I didn't, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Your life lessons in verse 13 are God's instruments to build contentment. We just noticed that your life circumstances are God's lessons on contentment in verse 12. Your life is God's school of contentment in verse 11. And then your life lessons are God's instruments to build contentment. In verse 13, you see the climax there of what contentment is in all of its riches. And this verse 13 is, is the great theme of all athletics. It's on your fridge, too. 
when you want to turn down that dessert, I can do all, I can turn down this dessert through him who strengthens me. Isn't that true? So it's at football games, sporting events, but that's not the context. The context is, I can be content through all things because he strengthens me. So the power comes in the class. The power comes through the lessons learned. And the all things, for example, in context, uh, begins around verse 12. Humble means, abundance, being filled, going hungry, having abundance and suffering need. And this was not stuff Paul made up. Some of this happened. Some of you are like, man, I don't think I can miss a meal. I get, what's the word they use now? Hangry. Y'all stop lying. Let's say, shame the devil tell the truth. Even you're sinfully angry, right? Paul says, I, I know what it means to go without. In other words, to, to really be hungry. And, but that doesn't, here it is, it doesn't alter my attitude or disposition. Now, if you say to me, like, you know, when I get hungry, yeah, you just got to stay out of the way. They're telling God, I can be content in hunger. Once again, what is the equation? It is contentment is Christ plus, so therefore I need food to be content. So your life lessons are there. All things, all of these extremes that he mentioned in verse 12, it's really the point here. All of life circumstances in verse 13 is the broader context in verse, for verse 13. So all the circumstances in verse 11 is the broader context of verse 13. I can do all of this because I have found that Christ is my all-sufficient one. And so it might look like this. Monday's traffic does not persuade you to change your thoughts about God and your highway neighbors because they are your neighbors. And the Bible says to love your neighbors yourself. Now, who is my neighbor? Your neighbor is the one who drives by you looking like a madman. We just love the ones who go too slow. They're always too slow when you're in a rush. Well, Tuesday's deadline will not alter your attitude. You missed the deadline, for example. And let's just say you lost a lot of money. When you come home, if you're content, the family won't even know. Unless the lights get shut off. But they will not know from your attitude that something happened. Because nothing changes the fact that Christ is still Lord of your life. Lack of something doesn't mean Christ lacks lordship. He's still ruling. On Wednesday, your friends do not have to avoid you because they know that's your day. What do they call Wednesday? They call it, and I just can't get over this hump. I got all these deadlines of the boss. And then now the issues at home are mounting up. The kids need uh, more funds, and it seems if I can't buy enough books for school, more notebooks. All of these things mounting up. So Wednesday is like, stay away. Y'all know Daddy. Yeah, stay away from Daddy. You know this is Daddy's day. That means it's Christ plus something else. And then on Thursday, if you're not doing all things. Through him who strengthens you, if, if Christ is not your portion, you will, your family will not hear or sense that you love Christ because they will hear and see your anger because of your boss. And then, if you're not satisfied with Christ, you really actually have TGIFs every week. Thank God it's Friday. But you know what? In contentment, there are no TGIFs. Because every day is great in Christ. And then as you go from day to day, it's one day nearer to heaven. That's contentment. That is contentment. So when you pass the school of contentment or you're passing it, you are thankful for every day because the Lord made it. And you know that every drop of every moment, God ordained for his glory and your good. 
Why is it so? Because God is self-sufficient. You need nothing outside of Christ to be content. Now quickly, I must add another potential snare, especially in our day and age. You or someone you know may struggle with this other snare. It is when you're so absorbed with life, you're so concerned with family activities. I have never seen so many family activities in my life that cost money. You used to play, we used to play sports for free. Now you have to pay for everything. Shoes and bags and kids are walking with, with sandals and then a, a, a basketball shoe in a bag and an expensive bag and they can't dribble a basketball. I have never seen such financial folly. For us, you had to do something to get something. Now they do nothing and get something. But this is a, the rage today. So it's not even Christ plus something else. You're so far gone in this situation with family activities. We have a, a gymnastic event. We have a, a football event. Uh, we, we, we have a, a soccer event. That it becomes actually everything else but Christ. And that is the rage today. That's the battle for many lives. Many families are battling this issue of everything else but the Lord. So here it is. Parents are driving their children to every activity under the sun. The weekends are booked with events and various competitions. And now we know, me personally, badminton is a bad sport. That's popular. But now we have pickleball, a sour sport. <laughs> and then you have two and a half children. And you still have one, your half child still has as much activity as your real child. 25 activities all throughout life. Everything in your life is everything but Christ. So not only are you not satisfied with Christ, but you're teaching your children here is that Christ and his church is an optional matter and not enough. You're telling your children that if you don't do this this week, then you and I will not be fulfilled. You're only saying that because you're an old man. Well, so be it, but it's biblical. So what happens with all this activity and all these things going on, you know what happens in a spiritual level. The expectations are not biblical. On a natural level, you have a very high dopamine level. So now church has to excite you. Oh, what activities do you have at this church? Do you, what sports do you have? The, the kids need a soccer field on Sundays. Do you have a soccer field for the children? Never mind you're going to hear the word of God as children here. No, 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 no. Do you have activities? Because kids can sit still for a few minutes, sir. Everything else but Christ. And then when you come back to the church, you're bored to death. You say, well, I'd rather stay home and dead stream the service. Oh, I'm sorry, live stream the service. <laughs> because church is boring. At least I can do something else while the preacher says something. To me. I've, got to, I've got to have some activity. Everything else but Christ. Before you know it, you have no Christ and you're left with nothing. Oh, we have to be careful of this, dear saints. May not be you or someone you know. That is the movement of our world. Everything else but the Lord Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, whether you are in that phase of life or older, by the grace of God, bring your life into submission to this divine class, God's school of contentment. Submit your daily schedule and life to the heavenly syllabus of this glorious gem that you may say that my God, the all-sufficient one, is my Savior. Therefore, I need nothing outside of Christ to be content. As I said back in the days, I'm out of time, but I'm not out of text. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for revealing your word to us, challenging us and encouraging us that Christ is all that we need. Fill our hearts with him, his goodness and his greatness from your word. May we study him from the scriptures, enjoy him, cherish him, love him, pursue him because he pursued us on the cross by offering his life up for us. 
Is anyone here in this building, O oh God of heaven, or oh, may they taste of the goodness of Christ? Open their eyes to their sins and, and their guilt and their lawlessness, that they're guilty of violating all of your laws because you demand perfection, and there's only one perfect one, the sinless Savior who came and died for them. May they turn from their sin in genuine repentance and sorrow and sadness over their sin and turn by faith and believe in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And may your saints ever rejoice that their sufficiency is in their sacrifice. And that sacrifice is the risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And be content in none other but him. In his name I pray and for your glory and for their good. Amen.